All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to WCN's Closer Look series. I uh, hope you enjoyed some of the Rwandan music we had to warm things up today uh, and some of the dance moves from one of our panelists for today. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Tommy Sheridan, and I help to manage WCN's Partner Network, which is an incredible group of world-class community-based conservation organizations that work to ensure wildlife and people coexist and thrive. So today we'll have the chance to meet two of our newest partners to the network. Um, but before I introduce them, I'll just share some quick housekeeping notes about Zoom. Um, so for those of you that are new, this is a Zoom webinar. So although the speakers, we cannot see all of the audience's videos, uh, you guys are still more than welcome in the audience to please write questions you have in the chat or in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, so we encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like throughout the talk today, uh, and we'll respond to them live after the presentation is finished. Um, so at WCN this year, we're actually celebrating our 20th anniversary. Uh, and coincidentally, we also have now 20 partners in our growing partner network. Uh, so today we'll have two of our newest additions to that network, which includes Conservation Through Public Health, also known as CTPH, and R Rwanda Wildlife Conservation Association also known as RWCA. Um, so we are very grateful for both of them to join us today, especially because it's so late on a Friday evening in their home countries of Uganda and Rwanda. Um, and I'm sure everyone is probably eager to get off the computer and get out dancing to Beyonce's new album or this Rwandan music we're listening to. Um, so we'll try to make it a quick one today, but hopefully an exciting one for your Friday afternoons. Um, so to introduce one of the first partners joining us today, uh, conservation through public health from Uganda. Uh, they focus on mountain gorilla conservation by protecting mountain gorilla habitat, but also promoting health for gorillas and humans that live alongside them. Um, so they're led by Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikosoka, who's joining us today. And Gladys founded CTPH way back in 2002. Gladys is one of the leading conservationists working to save the critically endangered mountain gorillas of East Africa. And she initially was trained as a wildlife veterinarian but has tr received tremendous honors for her work with CTPH and awards ranging from being named an Ashoka Fellow uh, to also recently a United Nations Environmental Program Champion of the Earth. So we're really excited to have Gladys joining us today. Um, and the other new partner joining us is Rwanda Wildlife Conservation Association, who focuses on the endangered gray crown crane. Now the gray crown crane in Rwanda is threatened across its range mainly by habitat loss, and also poaching for the wildlife trade. Um, and in 2014, Dr. Olivier Nsengimana founded RWCA to abolish the illegal trade of gray crown cranes in Rwanda. Since then, uh, RWCA and Olivier's work has been recognized and honored with many awards from the Rolex Award for Enterprise to the National Geographic Buffett Award for Leadership and Conservation in Africa. And many well deserved awards and honors. And Olivier was also, like Gladys, initially trained as a wildlife veterinarian. So I think you'll see today lots of overlap in their career paths and their leadership uh, of their own NGOs. So on that note, enough from me. I uh, will pass it over to you, Olivier, to share some more about RWCA. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. It's a great honor to be able to really be here talking to you as uh, the newest partner of uh, WCN. Um, for those who came in the room first, you saw me like dancing and dancing. Um, thank you for tempting me, Tommy and Megan, playing the Rwandan music, especially the kind of music that uh, we dance when we are imitating the cranes. So you see like, uh, these are the birds and the animals that uh, really means a lot in our culture. And I think it's the same uh, for Uganda because it's even a national bird for Uganda. So I'm glad it's good to say that. But I'm so happy and honored to be talking about the cranes. But again, I can't talk about the cranes without talking about myself because there is a lot of similarities. Like we've I've met the cranes like from uh, the very young age. So I'll go ahead and talk about myself. Like, so next slide, please. So uh, from this photo, like it can tell, this photo can tell a lot. If you ask me how my life was when I was a young boy, I would say 
I would describe it as a free range. So you see, when I was a young boy, my colleagues and I, my cousins, um, like we all went outside, would have fun in the nature. Uh, nature took care of us. Apart from jumping, like, like uh, going in the water, climbing the trees, we interacted with wildlife. Really, I would say like um, um, there was no distinction between us, like with those animals that we saw, we really enjoyed it. Next. Next, please. Next slide. So um, when we went home, like at the evening, instead of going home, we would turn up to our grandparents. This was the most precious time of my life. We would go home, like sit around the fire, and we really love to hear about the stories. And most of the stories that were told were the stories of wildlife. Like there were a lot of suspense, a lot of like uh, stories telling about, but most of the stories when I reflect back, there were stories that taught us how to coexist with nature, how to respect wildlife. The same way we respected our parents, our friends, was the same way we were taught to respect wildlife. Next. Next slide. So for me, um, it was like a combination, like being able to be out in the nature, to hear the stories. And the great crown crans, as you can see in this photo, was my highlight of my childhood. It was one of the biggest animal I could see with that golden like uh, crown, really with the same color as the sky at that time. I, I can't forget those images, like when we would see them dancing and calling, Really, those are the kind of image that stuck in my head. So this is really like how to describe my childhood. Next. So one of the be like a really the unique moment was when I would go to fetch water for my parents. Like in this photo, this is me as a young boy, um, watching cranes with their cheeks really coexisting. We took water, but we never took cranes. Um, I really like. This is something that stuck in my head, uh, cranes that are part of us, they are one of us. And I was proud to be part of this kind of uh, neighborhood that has had cranes, especially that really saying them as a young boy, I thought they were giant. I always wanted to fly like them. I, I wanted to dance like them. And this is really the kind of image that stuck with me. Next slide. So yeah, this slide is dark. Um, what I want to say is in 1994, everything changed in my country. When the genocide against the Tutsi broke in my country, everything was broken. The country was broken. People were broken. At the age of nine, I had to run. Without knowing where, I found myself in a neighboring country. Life was tough. Through a lot of struggles and people helping, I managed to survive. And when I came back in my country, I really wanted to do something to rebuild my country. I saw people broken. I saw really many kids like needing help. And I committed inside my heart. I wanted to be a medical doctor. I really wanted to do something meaningful, something that can play a huge role to rebuild my country. But I never spoke to anyone. There was a lot of ideas just running into my head. And I was thinking, how can I get there? But the only solution I knew I had to do well at school. So I really studied with a huge like a commitment and a huge goal really to finish and, and be able to do something. So at secondary school, we had to pass a national exam before we got orientation to go to the university. And when um, the points like, uh, the government decided to orient me to a vet school, exactly different from what I had imagined. But when I went to vet school, really, like, I could see most of the training was about livestock and, and I couldn't see how I can make a difference with what I was training. But I told myself, I've got to really, really, really like do at school. Maybe something will come out of this. 
So it's towards the end of the training, like at the vet school, that I met the people who inspired me, the people who were working with the gorillas. My university was so close to the Volcanoes National Park, and there was a group of gorilla doctors working to save the gorillas. And when I go there, my mouth was wide open, my eyes became big, and, and I said, wow, like actually this happens. It's like I was born again, like they like something clicked in me, that kind of love, the connection, the, the, the connection with nature. So being there, I told, I didn't tell anyone, but I told myself in my heart, this is it, this I'm, I'm taking, this is what I want to do. Uh, my life is going to be about conservation, saving the critical endangered, the endangered species, make sure that our species can be there forever and forever. So I stayed around and I got um, uh, internship with the gorilla. Next slide, please. And when the job happened to open, I applied and I became a gorilla doctor. And this is my very first, the, 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 my photo for the first time I ever put my hands on a gorilla. And really like I would go home thinking like, wow, finally I found something like being a vet and being able to use my skills to make a difference, to contribute to saving a critical endangered species in my country at that time. But you see, like I did like seven years at university and I was really tired. And when I was finishing, I told myself, I'm done. I'm going to sit and relax and really get paid and have, have some fun. But actually this is when the learning started for me. Really, we were saving the gorillas because there was a reason. And, and then I started looking about other species and when I looked for the cranes, the beautiful cranes I used to love as a young boy, I was shocked. Next slide. So the same cranes that we would roost in the trees, the same cranes that would dance for us, they, had, they were no longer in wetlands. They had come in the people's garden. These communities we used to coexist to love them. They had started poaching, catching them, and sell them to those who wanted to have them in their gardens. So there was a huge trade in the country, like locally people wanted to have them as pets, but also internationally. Cranes had lost a lot of their habitat. A lot of wetlands were changed into agricultural land. And at that time, there were less than 300 cranes in the whole country. And being a gorilla doctor, I thought really I was doing something really good and meaningful, and it was, but really I could not stand and watch the cranes disappear. So this is when really a lot of things went in my head. And this is when, like at the end of the day, I said, someone has got to do it. Someone has got to start something. So I had to really decide, and I decided to start another organization to save the great crown cranes. Next slide. So you might imagine like uh, everything when I started was perfect, but I just put this paper here. This is how my project, everything was on a paper. You don't have to read it, but I just wanted to tell you that like um, this paper, when I see it, I see passion. I don't see like a very elaborated plan, but this is how I started without a lot of money, without a how, without a huge plan. I started because I believe the cranes needed to be saving and I thought I could play a role. Next. So as I told you, like our ultimate goal was to really kind of raise awareness, tell the people, the ones that these cranes we used to love, these cranes we used to dance with, they're in danger. And if we don't do anything, they're going to disappear. So we asked everyone if they really want to give them a second chance, please call us. So, so many people really called us. I was overwhelmed. In the beginning, I thought no one would accept to give us their cranes, cranes are in their garden. But because we kind of touched people from uh, like at the lab, I told people, hey, you know, we, you love them, we love them, and we want to protect them. Together, we can do something. We can make sure our kids or grandkids are able to see the cranes. So um, this has really worked very well. You see, sometimes in conservation, we try to make a, like a kind of gap. We tell people, you are bad people, we are good people. But we try to show people like, hey, we are in this together. You've got cranes because you love them. And, but this, what you're doing is really endangering them. But we can do something different. And we create that kind of trust. And I went on radios, television. I put my phone number to the country, to the television, to show people like, really, this is um, an initiative by Rwandans. 
and we have to work together to make a difference for parents. So over the last seven years, we were overwhelmed, like people told us, come and take them. So we created a, data, a database and we identified all crimes in captivity. And we would go to those houses, take them and come and give them um, health checks. So I got to be a vet, not for the gorillas, but for the grains. So we would like look at their health and those ones that we found they can survive again in the wild, we took them back to the wild. Next slide, please. So we have now actually achieved our goal of not having any crimes in the captivity. We have released over 150 crimes in the wild. But throughout the process, we also came across a huge number of crimes that could not survive in the wild. And we've created the sanctuary for those crimes. Next slide. Next slide, please. So um, the crimes, like when we, Actually, something I wanted to mention is like when cranes were in people's garden, most of the cranes people would cut feathers to stop them from flying. So those cranes we took to the park, they would have like a chopped feathers. So it, we put them in a facility by the lake in the national park where they would grow new feathers, learn how to fly, and whenever they are able to fly, they fly again. So this is a photo showing you the cranes that used to be captive and being really at the lake shore, enjoying the freedom. And now the crane population that we have introduced back to the wild constitute about 16% of the whole population of cranes in Rwanda. Next slide. So, um, you might wonder like, uh, um, like why this photo? So you see, um, when I was a little, I really enjoyed the cranes. And I know I'm able to work to save the cranes because of that passion and that connection with nature. So, and I know that cranes ended in captivity. Things happened because there was that kind of disconnection. So my biggest, biggest homework, our biggest homework as our team is to go back into the community, into our homes, to kind of reignite the nature, take kids out, really learn, about, inspire them to love and grow with that kind of love. We really take them uh, into deep work, hands-on work to make actions like planting trees, really making them own nature. Next. Next slide, please. So we are now also, creating a lot of opportunities for communities to reduce the reliance on natural resources. Um, these members of the community, sometimes they do things because they don't have another choice or because they are not aware of the consequences. So with a lot of education, we also create a lot of jobs, for example, in habitat restoration and other kind of initiatives that brings like women and other members of the community together to talk about conservation, but also play a huge role in protecting all those species. Next. Over the last uh, seven years, we've been going throughout the country and identifying a number of really passionate uh, individuals who have like, that kind of love. So we built a team of marsh rangers and these are members of the communities from their own home who really accept to be part of our team and really look after the cranes habitat and the cranes and the cranes breeding site. So this is a group of women and men who really come on our team with a passion and, and really wanting to play a huge role. And we are so proud sometimes like when we are there, they are there, there and they are playing a huge role. Next slide. Would you play the video? So um, this is a video like showing you a group of conservation champions. And these are other group of people that we have and what they do, we empower them, we give them uniform, give them bicycles, binoculars, and then we go out, they will monitor cranes and other species, and they have smartphone. They will send us data in real time, 
and they will take part in the community initiatives like educating their fellow communities. We really like to focus up on women. We know that if you are going to succeed, we have to focus on women. Women create like a, or constitute a huge, a crucial role in our society. And, and they are the base of every foundation in the family, in the community. And we are really so proud to have like more than 50% of these groups being women. Next slide. So um, I, I just, this photo here, just to show you like how proud I am. Like sometimes I feel jealous. Like it really makes me so happy to see all these people, like the champions, the rangers going deep in those areas. Um, and when I see this photo, I picture myself in that photo and on that little boat wanting to be there. Sometimes I feel jealous, but you know, like I close my eyes most of the time and, and I feel like I'm with them because you see, when I started, I was alone, but now we have a team of about 169 people. And I know personally, alone, I cannot be everywhere in the country, but when they are there, we are together and we are all contributing to saving our crimes. Next slide. One thing that really came out uh, through this uh, uh, pandemic, COVID-19, is this photo. I want to tell you about it. It was on a Friday and we got a call from this conservation champion. He said, this, there were two chicks that were poached from a crane that he's been monitoring. So what usually happens as a veterinarian, I pack my bag, I jump on a car and run. But during COVID, there was a huge, like a long, long lockdown. I could not move. There was a lot of travel restrictions. I started with my team to look for travel clearance and, and when, um, when um, uh, we were about to get it, this man sent us a photo himself on this really very small boat, taking the two chicks back to reunite them with their parents. And when I saw this photo, it was like a mix of like happiness and cry because, you know, I was under lockdown with so many days you not know, going out. I was thinking, finally, I could get an opportunity to go out and really do something that I love to be the person I am, be a veterinarian. But when I saw this, like him going, I thought, oh, I've lost everything. I felt really bad thinking ah, I will never be able to practice what I'm doing. But, but also throughout all of this, I realized that actually it's not about me. It's not about me alone. It's about all of us. So this man was able to save these two chicks if he had waited maybe for the time we would get there, maybe they would have been stressed, um, maybe even like uh, the risk of dying would have increased, but also we would have burned a lot of fuel, like uh, other expenses. So I saw an opportunity, a very big opportunity. Actually, these are the people who are close to wildlife. How about we empower them to even make more difference on wildlife? So we saw a huge opportunity of training them. Next slide. So this year, we conducted a training of about 120 community conservation champions and rangers. And our target was to give them the skills on first aid to be able to stand in the right place to protect wildlife. And they have started using those skills. Recently, uh, one of the ranger like, really sent us a photo uh, there was a crane that was uh, like hot. And then he has already put like a, a hood on the face and he has done everything as a trend. And he called us after he has really managed to secure the bird and minimize the risk of stress and any other uh, complication. So this is the kind of empowerment that we are really working to, 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 to securing. We want the communities, these people, like at the proximity of those natural resources, at the proximity of wildlife, to be in charge, to be proud of it and take ownership and practice it. And this is how we can achieve uh, our, our, our goal of securing our species for generations and generations. Next. Next slide. So one of my highlight moments of all is really like being able to experience this kind of moment. Like this is a crane, one of the crane that used to be captive, 293, that had fallen in love with a free range crane. This crane was 
reintroduced back to the world and fell in love with the queen that wasn't captive and was really like heartbreaking, like kind of in a good way to see these young chicks born from this kind of crane and it really created something and showed me that there is hope. There is hope for cranes if we can all work together. So next slide. Next slide, please. So, like, like that crane, many other cranes, they are breeding. And we've seen really the population increasing. Over the last five years, we've been counting cranes. And we are really so thrilled to see like the population growing. In the only five years, we've been able to more than double the population. And we'll be counting in August, this is next month, around the 15th. And we are so excited and looking forward to saying what the number are going to look like. And I will be so happy to come and telling you the number in October when, 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 when I come to the expo in person. Next slide. This is a map that shows you like the distribution of grants. As you can see, this is a map of Rwanda, but you see the red dots or the orange dots, they are all distributed towards the, the, the borders of Rwanda. And when we see this kind of image, it shows us that these cranes, they must move. They must go to other places because cranes are like, they fly, they don't know borders. So over the last uh, three years, we've engaged a project to kind of understand the movement patterns of cranes. Next. So we've been using, like uh, looking at the cranes uh, that are nearly flying and capture them and feed them with GPS tags. And this is the GPS tags that gives us like um, the, the fixes, like uh, about number of fixes per day to understand the, the, the movements of cranes. Next slide. So on this map on the left, it's a map, uh, it shows you the, 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 the the movement of one crane, six month movement of uh, a crane that was uh, identified or tagged or banded in Rwanda and has moved a lot to go to Uganda and even a part of Tanzania. To the right, it's another crane that was uh, um, uh, more like a banded in, in Rwanda, but has moved a lot between Rwanda and Tanzania. And when we see this kind of image shows us that actually cranes, they push boundaries, they, go beyond the boundaries. And if you are going to be successful, we've got to work with others. So this year we've launched a transboundary collaboration initiative where we are really going to be working with other organizations in Tanzania and Uganda, and, and uh, hopefully in the future with Burundi to make sure we can secure the huge landscape where cranes uh, rely on in this landscape. And I really want to invite everyone who's listening today to join us on this case. We cannot secure the cranes in Rwanda if we don't work with other countries. And Uganda or uh, Tanzania cannot secure the cranes in their country without working with us. We need to get on this movement to work together. Next. So as we really, really, really like are inviting everyone to joining us, I'm happy to share this photo. Like uh, this is a photo of, uh, uh, one month ago when uh, Prince Charles came to see us and visit us and really like he took time to learn about the cranes and this was really good like uh, um, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, raising awareness but also like really uh, to see someone like him to come and, and learning and taking time to listen to the stories of cranes would love cranes to be understood and be um, and really put out up there to be to be helped. Next slide. Next slide. So this is was the highlight of, of last week for me. Um, so there was a big meeting here in Rwanda, the first of its kind, like uh, the African Congress uh, for, uh, for Protected Areas. Um, so this was the first of its kind and it happened in Rwanda. And it was so, so nice to really host it, to see so many conservationists from Africa coming 
to Rwanda to discuss about conservation. And really, uh, you see my, 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 my sister Gladys was there. Um, so, and, and everyone, like especially the wildlife partners, they managed to come to make a trip and they come and see us where we are based. And really like, we had like a very important um, um, conversation and deep inside me, I was kind of really crying with happiness to see really finally we see like a young conservationists really taking the lead and, and really this gives hope and, and a huge guarantee that our wildlife, our natural resources, our national parks, they are in good hands. And, and really I'm so excited to see what this brings in the future, but I can only see good results. So thank you so much, everyone who's listening. Um, I don't want to, I can say a lot, uh, but we interact in the question uh, in the question session. I would love to pass my sister Gladys to tell you about the gorillas as well in Uganda. Uh, Gladys, take it on. Um, thank you so much, Olivier, for the fantastic presentation. Um, I look forward to talking to you all about our work at Conservation Through Public Health. I've, I've been working with mountain gorillas for 25 years, and I'm going to talk about my conservation journey and why I started working with them. At the time that I started working with them, there were only about 650 left in the world, but we're glad that their numbers are really increasing. Next slide, please. I first got and heard about the mountain gorillas when I was setting up a wildlife club at high school in Uganda um, at Chiguli Secondary School. They told me that there were mountain gorillas and I really wanted to see them, but they were not yet habituated for tourism or research. And so I couldn't visit them. However, I got an opportunity to take the children in the school where I was to Queen Elizabeth National Park and it was a life-changing experience for me because we were able to see wildlife up close and it was just amazing, though it was sad that there was very little wildlife that we could actually walk. They said it was safe enough for us to walk because there were hardly any predators. And this made me realize how little wildlife there was. At the time, we didn't see any lions or leopards. And I felt that, you know, I'd like to be a vet who also works with wildlife. Having grown up at home with very many pets, I felt that I wanted to be more than a domestic animal vet, but to also work with wildlife. And actually in this photograph, it's during the time that I started conducting research, I actually studied chimpanzees before gorillas, very few people know that, but I did a short study at Budongo Forest because I couldn't visit Windy, the gorillas were not yet habituated. And I was looking at parasites in the dung, the fecal samples of chimps, and later on got to do this study in Windy Impenetrable National Park. Next slide, please. So I finally got to Bwindi um, and having spent a month doing research there and seeing the, the impact of tourism on the gorillas, I could already see that there were only two habituated gorilla groups for tourism, but already they were generating enough support and revenue for the communities that they were really excited about the gorillas. That was in 1994 when I first went to Bwindi. And being a vet student, it made me understand how tourism was very important for conservation. And at that point, I felt that I wanted to be a full-time wildlife vet. And so I got an opportunity to be the first vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. They were thinking of hiring a vet because tourism had just begun and they were concerned that people could bring a fatal flu to the mountain gorillas that were critically endangered, something like COVID-19. So they needed a full-time vet to make sure the gorillas remain healthy and don't pick up diseases from people. But of course, when I was there, I got to work with so many other different species. Next slide, please. And through our One Health approach to conservation that I'm going to talk about in my presentation, I was greatly honored last December to win the UNEP, United Nations Environment Program Champion of the Earth Award in Science and Innovation. And one thing that I said in my interviews, which they brought up was the fact that we need many more local champions from the communities where we're trying to protect this wildlife because they're going to become the decision makers. They're going to, and some of them will even become politicians and members of parliament who can decide whether to cut trees, to plant sugarcane, to destroy a forest, 
with precious wildlife. And it's very, very important to engage them and let them become the leaders in their communities and countries. Next slide, please. So the mountain gorillas, are, I don't know how many of you have visited them, but it's a really amazing, magical experience, once in a lifetime experience. And the mountain gorillas are found in two distinct populations. Um, this is a baby gorilla. Basically, baby gorillas stay with their mothers for four years until they're able to, they're old enough to build a nest. And gorillas move in a harem with a silverback. Next slide, please. The, he is the leader of the group normally. He determines the timing of activity and direction of travel. And normally it's the silverback with a number of females with babies and some black bucks, sub adults and juveniles. And basically the silverback holds the group together. And all the, all the gorillas are basically known, you know, each group is, is headed by a lead silverback gorilla. And when you get to Windy, normally they try and show the tourists the silverback. But it's also really interesting to see all the rest of the gorillas in the group. Next slide, please. And so the gorillas are found in two distinct populations. The Virunga Massive was the first discovered population where Dr. Diane Fossey studied, started her studies and in I think the late 70s, early 80s. And then the Bwindi population was discovered much later in the late 80s, early 90s. And where we're mainly doing our work is the Bwindi Impenetrable National Park. And within these populations, unfortunately they'll never meet because there's so much human population growth in the area. And so they, the best that we can do is to protect them where they are. And some of the greatest threats to the gorillas are habitat loss. Mm, as you saw in the map, the two gorilla population, mountain gorilla populations will never meet. And when you come, unfortunately, this is what you see. You know, there's cultivation right up to the edge. And that means that when it became a national park, people could no longer enter the park anyhow, and they're not allowed to go in and sustainably or unsustainably harvest timber. But sometimes the gorillas come out. And a lot of this is because of the very high human population growth, um, which is something that we've started to address also at Conservation Through Public Health. Next slide, please. But because gorillas come into people's gardens, um, this baby gorilla died of scabies. and Although I was hired to prevent disease between tourists and gorillas, one of the first cases was from the local community. They, there was a Peace Corps volunteer who reported to us, together with the park staff, that the gorillas are losing hair and developing white scaly skin. And I did actually ask a human doctor friend of mine, what's the most, most common skin disease in people? And she said it's scabies because low income groups of people are not very hygienic. They don't wash their clothes often and they tend to have diseases like scabies. So I went along with the ivermectin drug, which is perfect to treat scabies. Um, but it was strange for me because I did my vet training in the UK and which is like America, people don't get scabies. It's not a disease of people in the developed world, but they could occasionally get it from their pets, but it wasn't a common disease in people. And in the end, it was scabies. We treated the, gorilla, the rest of the group, but unfortunately the baby gorilla died. And even when we did the post-mortem, the body was crawling with mites even after the gorilla had died. And so we went ahead and treated all the group and also made sure that it hadn't spread to other groups. And four years later, another scabies outbreak occurred. And luckily we now knew what it was and they all got better. But then we also had cases that we weren't sure whether it was human related or not. Like this particular gorilla had a rectal prolapse and we weren't sure whether this gorilla strained to defecate um, by picking up a human parasite or a human you know, bacteria or virus. But anyway, went ahead and treated the gorilla, she got better, so six year, six year old juvenile, female juvenile gorilla. And we, we, this made me think that we needed to set up an NGO that improves the health of the people and the gorillas together. Next slide, please. Another thing that happened as well is the human gorilla conflict. Um, this is unfortunately happens quite often at Windy. Um, once the gorillas lose their fear for people and they're habituated, they'll leave the park and they like eating the banana plant. 
so they actually destroy someone's crop. And this particular farmer whose hand you see in the picture, I asked him that time that, do you think, do you still like gorillas? He said, I do, because my children, I think gorillas are important because my children are hired by the park and some of the money from tourism supports schools, clinics and roads. But the local farmer like me, whose crop is destroyed, I'm not being compensated. And sadly tourists they were, were being taken in his garden to see the gorillas after they had destroyed it. He was very upset. But later on, he became a member of the Gorilla Guardians, which is a group of human and gorilla conflict teams that had gorillas back to the park when they come out. And we believe that they picked up scabies when they went to people's gardens. People put out scarecrows, dirty clothing on scarecrows. They touched it and it spread through the group. So at CTPH, we keep the gorillas healthy and their habitat secure. Um, and we do, we realize that the gorillas cannot keep healthy if the rest of their habitat is not secure as well. So even when we started out CTPH primarily to prevent disease between people and gorillas, we found that we also needed to start to protect their habitats. And we founded the organization in 2003. Next slide, please. We have three integrated programs. The wildlife conservation program has a focus on wildlife health and habitat conservation. And then the community health program, we strengthen community-based healthcare, which is now widely accepted in Uganda because it's hard for doctors to reach communities' rights, especially those that border protected areas like Windy, which are very remote. So we train them to do conservation work and we call them village health and conservation teams. And we also work with community animal health workers and train them to care for the livestock of the communities. And then our alternative livelihood program focuses a lot on supporting our village health and conservation teams. But we also started a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise, something that my husband, who's a founder member, helped to initiate. And we, I'll talk to you more about it through the presentation. And another of our founder members, Stephen Rubanga, helped to set up the village health, village saving and loan associations and group livestock projects within the communities, especially the volunteers. Next slide, please. So in our wildlife conservation program, we look out for gorillas, clinical signs in the gorillas, and we train the rangers to do this mainly because we believe that they have to be doing it and they have it has to be part of their normal routine. They shouldn't see it as an interesting research project because they are the ones at the front line. They're the ones who are the first to get to the gorillas and they're the ones who take care of them and know what's happening with them every day. Next slide, please. We also collect fecal samples from the night nests. Every night, gorillas lay a nest and as they're getting up in the morning, they defecate in it. Um, and from it, we're able to find out what's happening with the gorillas and see if there's blood in the nest or something that's unusual. And so we set up a system of collecting samples every month from all the habituated groups and when it's abnormal, so that we're able to have an early warning system for disease outbreaks and, and know when something is abnormal, such as a rectal prolapse. That time, all I could do was treat the gorilla, do the surgery, and but we didn't know whether it, it picked up a human parasite. It was just a higher than normal burden of a parasite within the gorillas. And this is Anna Kleta, wildlife health technician, who goes out to the groups every, every month, working closely with the rangers and the gorilla guardians. Next slide, please. And we carry out comparative disease investigation. We look for diseases in the gorillas, but we also look for it in the people and the livestock. This is Jardia and Cryptosporidium that we're looking at under the microscope. And we find that when people collect water from and protected sources, they pick up diseases like this. And then when gorillas go to their garden and they find open defecation, they can pick up jadia or if their cattle defecate everywhere or in shared streams. So we try and then improve the hygiene habits of the people and build cattle water trust for the livestock as we also improve the health of the gorillas. Next slide, please. And this is done at our Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center. And this is a photograph outside our center. And, and this is a group of our village health and conservation teams. We have 270 of them all around the forest. Um, they're reaching, they're reaching 30,000 people in 6,000 households within 44 villages. And they focus on talking about good health and hygiene, 
get people to refer people who are sick for things like tuberculosis, scabies, HIV suspects, and now most lately it's been COVID. But also these people also talk about family planning, which is something I'm also going to talk a bit more about. Um, they also promote nutrition, sustainable agriculture, and they look at homes where gorillas have been coming and get the gorilla guardians to come out and herd them back safely. And they also talk about the benefits of the tourism. So the Wildlife Authority trains them on what to tell the communities, how they can access the tourism revenue sharing funds. And in there we have Sharon, our community health and conservation field officer who coordinates them. And uh, Stephen Mubanga is over there, he's our founder member at CTPH. And we're pleased that half our volunteers are men and half are women. So we, we hit the gender balance. And we found that, you know, this is our approach of engaging communities and engaging women in particular, because we deal with a lot of health issues, has really empowered them. This is a community where, you know, girls never went to beyond secondary school and there's so many teenage pregnancies. Uh, most women by the age of five have had 25, by the age of 25, I've had five children. By the age of 36, I've had 10 children and they look really haggard and they're not healthy. But through our program now, they're waiting to have babies every year and they're much happier. And when they have a female role model, training them and talking to them about these issues, um, talking to them in a group or as couples, they're more encouraged. And so here she's talking about, you know, gorillas will come in someone's garden, what should you do? But the good family, you know, the clean family knows what to do. They have the children they can manage. And eventually the son becomes a ranger, the girl becomes a nurse, the daughter becomes a nurse, whereas the bad family has too many kids, teenage pregnancies, and some of them die early. And there's a lot of conflict with the gorillas and other wildlife. Next slide, please. And so we focus a lot on preventing disease transmission um, between people and gorillas. And most people can't read and write in the local language. So it's translated into Ruchiga. And we're seeing a lot of people changing in the area because actually quite a number of them benefit from tourism. But even those who don't are happy that we're improving their health because we're showing them that we also care about them and not only the wildlife and the forest. Next slide, please. And we got into a partnership with Family Health International um, and they trained our volunteers to give safely give family planning injections. This was the most popular contraceptive depot. Um, it's now upgraded to Cyana Press. And through this, women can have babies only when they want to. They have more control over their bodies. They're much happier. And some of them even start businesses in between. And this has really liberated the women. And for the men, they're happy that they're able to balance the family budget much better. And they're doing this in the comfort of their homes because before when they would have to go to the hospital, they'd find an overworked midwife and she wouldn't attend to them and they would conceive. Now, during COVID, um, it became a terrible situation. We had an, a very big crisis when the pandemic began, not only for the people, but for the gorillas because they can easily pick up COVID because they've ever picked up other respiratory diseases, other common flu viruses, and we're worried that they could also easily pick up COVID. Next slide. Next slide, please. And so we, we work together with the Uganda government, the Uganda Wildlife Authority, and together with other conservation NGOs and got them to upgrade the gorilla viewing guidelines so that now everyone, when somebody visits the gorillas, they have to wear a mask. If you're within 10, 15 meters of a gorilla, you have to wear a mask the whole time, um, whether it's inside the forest or outside the forest. Next slide, please. And you have to be healthy and hygienic and maintain a distance from the gorillas. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, the lead silverback of Nkuringo Gorilla Group, Rafiki, got killed. And he was killed by a hungry bushmeat poacher who was not hunting gorillas, but was hunting diker and bush pigs. And this is something that the community did a lot before tourism. And when tourism started, the hunting for such species, the poaching really reduced because they were benefiting from tourism, but now tourism disappeared overnight. So a lot of people ha had stopped farming and they just, all their revenue was coming from tourism. And so it was very, very sad when Rafiki was killed, the group split and went from 17 to 11. And now they had to be headed by a black buck, which was, and the group became very unstable. 
This poacher was given 11 years in jail, which is the longest anyone has ever got in jail for killing wildlife. And when we went to check on the group, we found that they were, you know, they were healthy but unstable and frightened. And they are now being headed by Ramutwe, who's a, a black buck. Um, and I, the porter who took me to the gorillas had a mask saying in honor of Rafiki. So most of the community members were very, very upset that Rafiki had been killed because he had enabled tourism to really develop in that southern sector of Windy, where the poorest part of the community lives. But I was able to give him our job after six months because after five, that time it was actually after four months because I was able to take him to with me when we went to check on Rafiki, Rafiki's group. Next slide, please. And we realized that as long as you're having many hungry bush, bush meat poachers and people are hungry, they're going to enter the forest to poach. Um, so we started a ready to grow program where we provide fast growing seedlings to the local communities. Actually, this idea came from Malago Foundation who also support our work. They were working with another development group near us that were doing this in communities further away from us. And so they gave us a lot of ideas on how to do this. And we got into food security because ready to grow is something that it's not only short term to help them through the COVID pandemic, where when we give out questionnaires to, the, to them, we've reached 1,500 with support from WCN. It's been fantastic and other donors. Um, when we reached these people, they told us that they were poaching because they're hungry. And the pandemic really created this hunger, increased the hunger. So now they're able to eat and it's reduced their need to enter the forest to poach, which is great. We give them 10 different types of seeds, seeds and seedlings, and within one to three months, they are growing and they're able to eat. And it's something that we're continuing long after the pandemic because we realize that food security is another way to reduce poaching and other threats to the gorillas. Next slide, please. And here I am with uh, Hope Masiko, who's one of our lead volunteers. We went to visit her home, actually we were with Tommy when we visited her. She was very excited to see us and served us pumpkin and as a beneficiary of Ready to Grow and, make, and telling us how she's getting all of her communities to checking on the communities and making sure their crops are growing well. Next slide, please. Um, Gorilla Conservation Coffee is a social enterprise we started in 2016 because often when I go to check on the gorillas, we'd see farmers digging and they're not part of the tourism industry. Not everyone can be a ranger, a porter, you know, or sell crafts to tourists. And so we started to feel, why don't we give them um, better prices for good coffee and reduce their need to enter the forest to poach. And the view that I've just shown you behind is the view from our Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center. If you happen to visit, you see that view. And in Uganda, they grow very good coffee, both Arabica and Robusta, but Arabica is what you normally get in coffee shops like in America. And yet they were not getting a fair market or a steady price. And so actually Coffee View in, coffee review in California were able to taste, to do a cupping of this coffee and it was among their top 30 coffees in 2018, which was very exciting. And now we're trying to get all the farmers to grow the same kind of coffee so that they can really, really benefit from conservation. And here we are, you know, training them on how to process the coffee. We work with agronomists and through this way, we're developing a global coffee brand to save gorillas one sip at a time. Next slide, please. So during the pandemic, we found that even if our main market was tourists and they had disappeared overnight, we could reach markets outside Uganda in the UK and then later on in the US when things opened up in 2021 and also in New Zealand. And so we're trying to see how we can support the farmers and so that they don't only have to depend on tourists to come to check the gorillas. And this helps to keep more people out of the forest during the pandemic. Next slide, please. I'm going to end off by talking about some policy changes that we're bringing about not only in Uganda, but in other parts of Africa. Before that pandemic, people were getting too close to gorillas. 60% of the time, people were breaking the rules and 30, 40% of the time, the gorillas were breaking the rules. You visit the gorillas, they come really close and it wasn't good for the gorillas. And of course, COVID being so contagious, we're very worried that they'll pick up COVID. And so now we felt that this needed to be spread to other countries in the world. Next slide, please. 
Um, we also felt that we needed to keep sensitizing the communities about COVID. So with support from donors like ACAS and Solidaridad, we developed this poster and we had a picture of a gorilla and people knew how to call if they see gorillas in their garden and they all have to wear masks. And this really helped to reduce the contact with them between the people and the gorillas in the local communities. But the wildlife, this, we developed a policy brief where we got the government to upgrade these rules all over Africa. So all the countries in Africa that have gorillas and chimpanzees, we developed a policy brief for them to follow these regulations. Um, next slide, please. And just this photograph, normally just as you're going into the gorillas, you have to sanitize your hands and your boots, disinfect your boots on top of having your temperature taken before you enter, wearing a mask and being ready to maintain a respectable distance from the gorillas, which is now 10 meters. Next slide, please. And we launched this policy brief last week at the African Protected Area Congress, which Olivia talked about. Um, and we're very excited because there are 13 countries in Africa that have great ape tourism out of the 21 countries, and we want them all to adopt this policy brief. So together with International Gorilla Conservation Program under the Africa CSO Biodiversity Alliance, we launched it. And uh, we're really grateful to Wildlife Conservation Network for enabling me and two of my staff to be able to go to Rwanda for this big event, where we also gave many talks on our work in the various pavilions. And the mountain gorilla population has continued to grow over the past 25 years. I participated in the very first census in 1997, and we're hoping that this trend will continue, but um, we, there's still lots of threats. There's COVID, there's, you know, economies going down, there are many things going on, and we really need your support to keep going. And we want to thank you so much, the WCN donors, for all the support you've given us so far. Um, we encourage you to come and visit us and thank you so much for all the great support. Next slide. And that's my team, um, including, uh, and for more information, please visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter and buy my book, which is coming out in November this year about my conservation journey. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Gladys. Thank you, Olivia, <laughs> for such presentations. Um, to our audience, so we know we're at the top of the hour, so if you have to hop off, no problem at all. Uh, uh, we're still recording this presentation, so we will go through some of the question and answers now with Gladys and Olivier. Um, but we'll send you a recording if you need, and it'll be up online too. Um, okay, so I'm going to get started with some of the questions that came through. We had tons of applause for you guys and good questions. Uh, one of the first ones is many of our audience members were really interested in coming to visit to see the gorillas and cranes, of course. Uh, to learn more about your work. So they, one of, a few of them asked, how could they decide between seeing the gorillas in Uganda versus Rwanda? And this might be a bit of a rivalry with you guys. Uh, <laughs> what do you recommend? And maybe the answer is just go see both organizations and know what you do. But what do um, you guys I recommend coming to Uganda to see the gorillas and then crossing the border. It's a very short distance and going to see the cranes with Olivier. <laughs> and actually it's half less than half the price to see gorillas in Uganda than Rwanda at the moment. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Uh, so the answer is for all of you, I think definitely go see both organizations. I had the pleasure to both CTPH and RWCA in November of last year, and it was a really eye-opening experience. So I encourage all of you to go and learn about their work and support them too. Um, Okay, so quick question, Gladys, about the gorillas is, can you clarify about the difference between the species of uh, mountain gorillas and lowland gorillas? Yes, they, they are four different gorilla subspecies. Um, the mountain gorillas are only found in Uganda, Rwanda, and DRC. And then there's the eastern lowland gorillas only found in DRC. Um, they are slightly smaller, they have slightly less, less hair, and because they live at a slightly lower altitude and they eat more fruit and climb more trees. Oh. And then there's the Western lowland gorillas, which are even at a lower altitude. And they're found in about eight countries in Africa, mm. including DRC and all the rest, like Cameroon, Nigeria, Gabon, CAR. And then there's a cross river gorilla, which is only found in Nigeria and Cameroon. And they're even fewer in number than the mountain gorilla. There's only about 300 cross river gorillas. Mm. And they're considered to be a a subspecies of Western lowland, mm -hmm. um, but 
they're a bit slightly different. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. And Olivia, a question about the crane. So uh, you mentioned a little bit about them being like a totem animal. Uh, can you tell us more about the cultural history of gray crown cranes in Rwanda and maybe Uganda as well? Um, and what do they yeah, mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, you see, like uh, when I was growing up, uh, I found this culture, which is still stands, like traditionally, like uh, Rwandan families, they were divided in different families. So each family had a name. So each family or clan would have uh, a totem or a family animal. So crans were, is a totem for some of the family. So when I, the way people respect each other between families and it's the same way they respected um, uh, those totem animals. For example, when we were kids, I, I knew I would not kick like a frog because I knew it was totem of my friend. I would not like uh, harm another species because I knew it was a totem. So the way we loved each other, the way we protect each other, we coexist, it was the same way we're incorporating our species. So yeah, cranes are linked to our stories. And, and again, um, uh, it's one of the species that people related to a lot, especially when it came to dancing. Uh, in Rwanda, like uh, the traditional dance, people like, like to dance with arms and they imitate cranes and, and the cows. So with big horns, <laughs> like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, we'd love to see you dance too. You get it. Uh, <laughs> So a question for both of you. So this coming Sunday, July 31st, I believe is World Ranger Day. Um, and a few of the audience members were asking about uh, what can be done to protect uh, the protected areas or parks that both cranes and gorillas live in. Um, so can you guys share a little bit about how you collaborate with rangers or National Park Service to protect the species you, you work on as well? Maybe we'll go Olivia first and then go ahead. So yeah, um, I think um, what we do is really like the ranger they are at the heart of protection of all of these places. They are often the people at the forefront of all the challenges. So um, as an organization ourselves, we really like, I like to put a lot of efforts in the building capacity, but also really being there with them. And, and, and again, um, uh, they can be easily forgotten because it's, it's so nice to see like uh, this kind of day coming up and uh, putting, we want them to shine and uh, to be uh, highlighted as the heroes because we know the kind of work they are doing there. And really we ask everyone to support Ranger's efforts, but also to uh, kind of shine. Like if you know a Ranger, if you know an organization that has Rangers, please, yeah, let's just bring their stories out and, and uh, we put them at the forefront and empower them to do more of the work that they do every day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about you guys with the Uganda Wildlife Authority? In Uganda, we work closely with our Wildlife Authority Rangers, and we do, we've, we've actually been part of the Task Trust Wildlife Ranger Challenge, where they, they see who are the fittest rangers and they get a prize at the end. But then this, this, through this, we're able to raise money, which then supports them. And during the pandemic, we've been helping them with food rations because the money that was, the little money that was able to come from tourism could only pay salaries and they weren't getting enough food rations to go to the field. And if they get food rations, then they, they really stay out longer and look after the, the gorillas and other wildlife and carry out proper patrols. So it's been helping with food rations and building mobile toilets so that when they're inside the, the park patrolling, they actually have a toilet and they can also have one month, they can have lots of tents and they can be out there to look out for the poachers and for any, and monitor the gorillas. So we've been really supporting the rangers much more during the pandemic than we did before because the, of the less money coming for tourism to run the park operations. And this Wild Ranger Day, we're also just joining on to again the next Task, task Trust Wildlife Ranger Challenge. Wonderful, cool. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, everybody probably keep an eye out on Sunday. I'm sure there will be a lot of messages around social media for World Ranger Day, where you can learn more about CTPH and RWCA support for rangers too. Um, but it, it's clear that, of course, today you're only getting to meet these two individuals, Olivia and Gladys, but they work with such wide ranging teams in their own countries and collaborators in the government and rangers that are dedicated to this work too. So shout out to all of them around the world. 
Um, okay, so I want to switch over. There's a few questions about One Health specifically. Uh, so one of them actually is from Zachary, who said he's currently a vet student who is pursuing a master's in public health. Um, and he's interested in learning a little bit about your recommendations for career steps uh, to after school is over. Would you recommend any experiences or jobs that would kind of uh, pursue a good path for both conservation and public health? And we can go back. Um, I would say that if he would like to get into One Health, um, he's currently doing a master's in public health. Um, it would be good for, for him, yeah, to, to still, the master's in public health is great. It's also good, good to also get some experience in conservation medicine and, you know, to just, I, I actually got my experience just by being in an organization surrounded by conservationists. And then I conducted research on tuberculosis at the Human Wildlife Livestock Interface as part of my zoo medicine residency at North Carolina State University. And that's when I really got into public health. So doing research projects as part of your master's will really help to, to learn a lot about One Health and conservation medicine. Awesome, thank you. Olivia, anything you wanna add about your journey in One Health? I would say like um, uh, Zachary had already made a step uh, already, like <laughs> you've been talking about it, being here, you already know Gladys, you know me, you know other people. So networking and uh, being able, like I think just the, yeah, the people we meet, the opportunity, the talks, everything, it all contributes to orienting us to, to, to the path that we want to follow. So, and, and everything, the knowledge, the, the thing we talk, like, uh, listen, it helps us really to, to shape uh, our career. So I feel like, uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing already. Uh, be in touch, have some experience, like uh, go to the field, get to learn, like uh, hands-on, like uh, try to find those kind of opportunities that will help you really to, to feel like even, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is, this is it, like uh, feel like uh, not only at university, but also go into the field and like, have that kind of experience to make sure that's what you really want. And, and then from there, like, yeah, you can make a huge thing, a huge difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I will have time for maybe two more questions. I'll try to squeeze in, but we'll let you guys get some rest tonight too <laughs> and enjoy your weekend. Um, but one of the questions is, uh, can you guys share uh, specifically the questions for gorillas, but I think it'd be interesting to hear for cranes too. Uh, when rangers or medics are approaching them, uh, how do you actually touch the animal or approach them in a safe way? Gladys, could you share from gorilla's perspective? Yes, when you're having to do an intervention on the gorillas, um, you it's actually can be quite tricky because they're very intelligent creatures, and very intelligent, unlike other wild animals. So they, you have to always be aware of where the, the head of the group is, the silverback, because he's very protective over all the other gorillas. So the first thing you have to do is when you're darting the gorilla, first of all, you have to hide the dart behind your back, the, the dart gun, because they know what you're going to do if you've done it before. And once after aiming and you know in the right place, the thigh, or some place like that, and the gorilla starts to go down, you have to create a tent around that particular gorilla. And very brave trackers have to chase away the silverback, very brave trackers, uh, because he can really charge. And nobody's allowed to run, because if you run, people get hurt. Like whoever's in the pathway of the gorilla will get hurt. And then that's how we're able to carry out the treatments. And then even returning the gorilla back to the group is the next problem where people can get hurt. So that has to be done very carefully as well. But again, you need brake trackers and everybody's part of the intervention team. Incredible. They're, they're so intelligent, gorillas, so you just have to be careful how you do it. <laughs> and Olivia, how about with cranes and the rehabilitation center you worked on? How do you approach cranes? So yeah, um, uh, so cranes, you know, yeah, they fly as opposed to the gorillas. So we cannot use like that, that guns. We, um, so most of the cranes, when they are injured, when they are, they, are, they are in a state when they are not able to fly, or if, for example, the cranes we've been working with, like when people clip, uh, cut their feathers, they cannot fly. So we physically handle them. We find ways to capture them. 
um, like in a way that uh, um, uh, reduces the stress and, and the injuries. There are some of the cranes actually that can be also, that can come to you charging, like wanting to, to peck at you. And uh, sometimes like um, you see like a, when a brother is tall, like you, sometimes people you raise like something to show them you are tall and, and uh, it kind of brings them down. So yeah, when you want to catch them, you corner them in an area um, and then you're able to handle them. So one of the first things that we do when we, we have cranes in our hands is really to, to use a blind to put something to, to, like, uh, to make them not look outside because they stress when they can see outside, they stress more. So, but when we have like, uh, uh, we, we hide, we, we blind them, um, they reduce the stress and they are more calm and we're able to work with them, like uh, handling them physically. There's someone handling and another vet is uh, doing whatever we do uh, on them. So most of the time we do like uh, on physical handling, handling them physically, unless there is a very, uh, a surgery that has to happen. We put them on anesthetics, like a gas anesthesia and other type of monitoring to make sure like uh, reduce that kind of pain and, and, and stress. Awesome, okay. And then the last question, I wanted to finish this because uh, this past week, I think it got a lot of media in the New York Times and others, um, but a few individuals asked about, recently uh, the DRC said that they have some plans to offer more oil and gas leases in the Virunga National Park. Um, and of course, this is your neighboring country, not where you guys work directly. Um, but I think you guys could probably offer us some advice and recommendations about the complexities of this in conservation when a poor country has to determine how to value their natural resources. And the question is from the audience, um, do you have any recommendations or what can be done to uh, balance this and how to stop the development in a protected area for critical habitat? Um, and what benefits can be given to countries to help navigate these challenges? So I'll go to Gladys first and then I'll maybe we'll finish with you. Um, yes, it's been a very bad breaking news um, about what DRC is planning to do. Hopefully it's not going to go through, but I think the whole point is people are so poor and desperate and they're not, it's very hard for tourism to really develop there because of the civil war and conflict. And so luckily in Uganda and Rwanda, guerrilla tourism and, you know, is really bringing a lot of revenue for the country. It's much, much harder for the government to even think about something like that. But I think in DRC, there isn't enough coming in from tourism and they're wondering what to do about all those poor people around the Virunga. And maybe they think oil will be a good, op a good option but it's, going to, it's a very short-term option. And of course, it's going to destroy the habitat. And I think the gorillas will get affected. So I'm not really sure exactly where they're doing the old drilling. Maybe Olivia will know. But one thing though is, there's been talk about carbon credits because the Congo forest is one of the largest forests in the rainforest in the world. And it's very good for carbon as a carbon sink. And I'm wondering, maybe the money from carbon credits is not enough. They need to offer more money which is more than what they would get from drilling oil in order to save this, this rainforest. But it's up to the governments that have the money in the developed world, America, UK, you know, Europe, all those countries in order to see if they can do something quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a very complex topic. Olivia, is there anything you want to add to it? Yeah, um, uh, something I can add to that is like, uh, yeah, this is a very complex and uh, difficult issue. Um, but as much as really it's happening in DRC on the side of Virunga, it's a concern for the whole gorilla population because uh, this gorilla really survive or rely on this uh, Virunga massive to, to, to survive. So yeah, um, I think there is a platform called the Greater Virunga Transboundary um, collaboration, which is like uh, an initiative that was signed uh, by three countries, Uganda, Rwanda, and, and DRC. And I think that's where most of these kind of such big issues are raised, where government come on a, on, on a table and discuss and, and really uh, try to find a solution uh, and, and a kind of balance. Uh, um, um, uh, yeah, uh, like a, what is the Congo try to solve with this oil drilling is there an alternative. So I think as Gladys uh, mentioned, 
um, uh, really with tourism, there might be a lot of potential, but unfortunately because of uh, a lot of armed groups in the forest as well, like uh, it's been really becoming in the way of tourism, which is also another political issue that needs to be solved to ensure the, the survival of, of those gorillas uh, for, for a long time. So I think as much as we are conservationists and uh, this shows that um, there is, we cannot succeed alone. We need politicians on board. We need everyone on board. So um, our voices and uh, through like, uh, like uh, different channels goes and uh, we really push to sit in with the politician to tell them our concerns, but also to really bring them on board to, to take some of the decisions that can really allow to, to protect those uh, kind of landscapes. So uh, I think there is a need of all of those uh, concerns to come together and discuss this and find a way, uh, an alternative and, and in a way, yeah, this can be, yeah, stop. So, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, thank you both. Yeah, I think uh, it's inspiring that you and your teams are still working so hard every day in and out to 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 present the value of, of conservation to people living in your country and to our listeners today around the world. Um, so thank you for that. And I think hopefully with more support um, and the listeners today, hopefully come get involved more in WCN events and support the partners like RWCA and CTPH so that we can help fight this long battle together. Um, so I just want to close off for today uh, and thank Olivia and Gladys for joining us to tell us about their organizations um, and for staying up late. We thank you guys so much for that. Uh, and if folks are interested, we do have another closer look next month, uh, Friday, August 26th at 12 p.m. Pacific time again. Uh, and that will be with two of our other partners, Project OTT and Snow Leopard Conservancy who will share about how to engage children in conservation so that the next generation uh, is still involved in this fight for conservation as well. Um, so I think Megan had shared in the chat a link to register for that if you guys are interested, um, and also to support RWCA and CTPH if you're interested as well. So I just wanna close by a huge thank you to Olivia and Gladys and everybody that tuned in today. Um, I hope you guys get some rest and keep up this incredible fight together for conservation. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful and week. Congratulations on the group and the people we work with as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Mm.